Hey everybody, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to my Sunday live stream where we talk about photography and catch up with everyone. I hope everyone's doing well and happy holidays. Uh, the Christmas is right around the corner and then we also have a new year. So happy new year if I don't see you again before uh, that happens. But um, this year feels different somehow. Um, you know, the it, it was so... It was really such a good year for me uh, personally. Um, professionally is about the same. You know, I'm not like making any more money or less money than I've ever have, which is not much. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think I feel like um, I've grown quite a bit this year as a photographer and really appreciate um, where my photography is going. And, and I, I, I know um, the channel is not about me, but I just, felt like I, I wanted to share that because, you know, last year I, I'd run into a rut and I overcame it somehow <clears throat> through um, just, I don't know, something something clicked last year where I started to see, get a see and get a feel for the kind of photography that I like to do and enjoy. I mean, I enjoy all types of photography, but um, the ones that I find most rewarding is really in uh the the street photography and not I, and i would say it's more like architectural photography uh but also in in the self portraits i've been doing lately i'm starting to really get a feel for the kind of imagery i want to make and and um uh, and create so to speak uh I, I feel like i'm tapping more into the creative side of my photography now and i'm not relying so much on all of the technical things about photography and in fact you know i've just given up on a lot of things uh on the technical side you know like all the different rules of composition for example uh, what is correct exposure you know exposing to the right i mean there's there's so many things in photography uh that are important and sort of the foundation to building your photography you know over your lifetime uh, but at this point, I I don't have to think about those things, the fundamentals. You know, I can go out and I can shoot and I can focus on my compositions, the story that I want to tell and, um, you know, being creative. Uh, so before I go any further, let me check the chat and uh, you guys let me know if you can see and hear me. OK, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Whenever I get out, it's early for me, you know, whenever I get up in the morning, I have, you know, a lot of congestion, but, uh, yeah, so I, and, and that's, that's where I think, you know, I'm, I'm finding the most enjoyment now out of photography than I ever have, uh, because I can explore these, these other areas in a way, <clears throat> and I don't mean different genres, so to speak, but just explore the same scenes that I've been to a thousand times, but see it very differently. And, you know, I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm still into gear as much as anybody. I got gas as bad as anybody else, uh, save for maybe Eric Jennings, right? Um, who, who has a terrific channel and I, I relate to very, very well because he just has such bad gas. And when he buys a camera, he sees, you know, something different every time, right? Like he really appreciates what that camera is all about. And then I think somehow he misses what the previous camera he had was all about. And then he goes back to that, then he's missing something else. So there's never a perfect camera, so to speak, for him. And I hope that, you know, at some point he can kind of be in a place where you know, the, the gear is not critical, you know, just whatever you're using is perfectly fine. Uh, because cameras these days, they're just getting so complicated. I mean, it's just so daunting. Maybe I'm just getting older, you know. I mean, I when I started the channel six or seven years ago, um, I, I couldn't wait to get into, you know, deciphering the menu and finding all of the various different features and digging into this and that and the other thing. And, you know, as recently, because of gas, I purchased this, this Fuji and this Sony thing. 
uh, I I just it, I'm not interested in getting into the menus so much anymore, uh, and and finding every single little feature. Now I do it out of curiosity sometimes, and because people ask me questions, you know, in the comment sections, like I got a question recently about the Fuji. Uh, and I'm saying, yeah, I didn't know. I don't know. Let me let me see what I can do. Right, it has something to do with focus bracketing, and I'm still looking into that because my initial attempt at it just was terrible. Uh, but so on and so on. And then this the, the, the rise of other types of gear by third parties. Like I use a lot of Godox equipment. As you uh, start to use this gear, you start to find deficiencies that it just, oh, it's really frustrating. Like, you know, focus, in-camera focus stacking doesn't work with Godox flashes on the OM-1, but it worked on the EM-1 Mark III. Why? Why? What What changed in the OM-1 uh, in terms of the, the contacts and things that all of a sudden stacking doesn't work? And what does Godox need to do to get that to work again because OM system is not changing their firmware to work with a Godox flash so Godox Godox has to adapt somehow and I doubt they will you know because it works on everything as it is but anyhow um I I you know my general consensus though is this year has been one of one of my best years ever photographically speaking and i i i think in that respect my channel may change a little bit next year uh and not concentrating so much on the details and the and the training and the review you know not and i don't know how to how to say it but you know peter forsgaard you know has recently made a very big shift in that sense right he's he's focusing more on photography and you know, uh, helping you to become a better photographer, and not so much on the gear anymore. And I really respect that. And and I I see he's not getting the same kind of views he was, uh, you know, when we talk about gear on our channels because gear is kind of the low hanging fruit on YouTube in terms of getting views. But uh, as you progress in your photography, you, you really start to appreciate. The photography and not the gear you know what what it is you're taking pictures of and why you're taking them because at our hearts uh whether it's peter or robin jimmy emily's the two emily's and and everyone out there uh that you see online um regardless of the kind of video they create right whether it's photography related where the gear doesn't matter or it's specifically about gear uh, like in my case, I made a nine millimeter lens review the other day. Uh, you know, at our in our hearts, we started with a camera and didn't know anything, right? We started just like everyone else, and we had some desire to take pictures, and that's still at our core. You know, I I love going out on photo walks and taking pictures. You know, one of the reasons I got into photography was take pictures of my dog, which I still do, you know, all the time. And uh, that's at our core. And it's it's. Um, and, I, and I hope that comes through when we're creating our videos. Um, you know, the, a lot of us have to make a living off this as well, not necessarily our main income, but as a supplement. So we, you know, we have to cater to the market demands and also what manufacturers want us to promote. So, and, you know, we try to promote the things that we feel would be useful to our viewers. You know, I know I certainly do. I, I try to avoid all these products that I don't care about and I don't think you guys would care about. Uh, but I like to, I like to look at products because now I'm just... You know, I do like one review and now I'm getting inundated with like requests to do reviews. <laughs> there's a kind of a gap there most of the year where I didn't get too many requests, but now all of a sudden they're just all coming in. So I got a couple lenses coming in next week. Um, I have a tripod I'm going to review. 
but these are things I was very selective about. You know, I didn't just randomly take things because I was getting free stuff. You know, it, it was because um, something interests me about that. And I think it's something I can share. And I'm going to try and do my reviews more in a uh, from a photographer's perspective. You know, like if I do a lens, you know, like my nine millimeter review is kind of a little taste of where it's going to go. And I'm going to try and emphasize the photography side a little more. <clears throat> but you know, what do you do with a 28 millimeter? That's going to be my next lens. I think it's a 28. It's a 28 f2.8. But, you know, what kind of photography do you do with that? Why would you choose such a focal length? And, you know, and I'm just going to briefly cover kind of the specs and the technicalities of it because there, you know, there's certain core things a lens has to be able to do, right? It has to be able to be sharp and focus and uh, have some, you know, minimal chromatic aberrations and all that all that good stuff but i want that to be sort of like in the first couple of minutes of the review and focus more on the photography side so i'm trying to think of ways with this tripod for example to talk about why you would need a tripod um because there's it comes down to it everything honestly to me is starting to feel the same you know whether i'm shooting the sony a7r5 or my uh EM5 Mark III or my Pen F, uh, they they just feel, I just don't feel that any particular piece of gear is helping me more or holding me back, you know, because ultimately the basic fundamentals of photography haven't changed, right? It's all about lighting, composition, um, telling the story, all that, all that good stuff. And that's why this year I, I feel like that I've kind of transitioned from this like gear orientated, like every little spec, every little feature in the menu. It's not it's not making any difference in my photography. The things that make the most difference in my photography is right here, right? How I see things in the world and what kind of like reward do I get from the images that I share, you know, because a lot of images I share, they don't, you know, my favorite images that I share hardly get any likes sometimes, you know, on Instagram, and that's fine, right? But it, it's, what I'm sharing is part of who I am, and what I, how I want to project who I am to the world. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, it is what it is, right? Whether anybody cares or not, it's not important. All that's important is what how I feel about my photography and um, what I want to project. And, and, and that's really my message to everyone is don't worry about, you know, getting likes and getting any kind of recognition or justification for what you do. If you like doing it, do it. You know, uh, if you like gear, you know, get, get the best gear you can afford or, or something that checks your checks, the boxes, anything that will inspire you, to get out and get into photography and do photography because life is short, right? We have to enjoy our lives and what we do and, and how we interact with others. And, and, and I, I don't know, I'm kind of getting off topic, I guess, but, uh, 20, 2023 is, is great. And, and it's, Unlike when I was in 2021 during the you know pandemic times, I couldn't wait for the new year to start. Like I couldn't wait really for it, not the new year to start so much, but for the current situation to end, right? Because it was just really frustrating a lot of things. Um, and it, it was a great opportunity to explore certain aspects of photography. Uh, you know, indoor stuff, trying to be creative in your house, finding things, you know, because we were stuck indoors a lot. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, the previous years have always been about, I can't wait till it's over, right? And let's, let's get on, let's move on. And this year, 2023, um, I'm a little sad, right, that it's already over because it's been such a great, great year uh, for me anyway. 
And <clears throat> I'm very excited about 2024 and what I can do, but I'm trying to think of how am I going to share this enthusiasm and this excitement and this this uh, this newfound sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <clears throat> Epiphany. That's maybe a little extreme. Um, but how am I going to share that and inspire you guys? Or for those of you that are struggling in photography, either creatively or technically, right? Maybe the camera is too complicated, which is another issue. Uh, how am I going to help you to get past those barriers and move on and enjoy photography as much as I do? Um, because photography is such a, such, you know, like Robin Wong always says, photo, photo, what? I forget his saying now. Um, shutter therapy. Oh my God. Another thing with getting older is my memory is just not what it used to be. And sometimes I forget the entire English language is terrible. But, you know, <clears throat> that's what I want to do is, is I want to inspire people to go out and shoot more. Uh, and, and, and try because it, it really is very, um, therapeutic doing photography going out particularly going out in nature and wildlife and just appreciating the the beauty of the world that we live in whether it's nature wildlife or even city life you know there's beauty to be found everywhere and capturing those moments and being able to to uh look at those images later and put them together to tell a story maybe you know the, these are the things that photography means to me now and whereas before it was always about you know did i get the lighting right did i get the composition right you know where are my leading lines rule of thirds uh did i expose to the right and can i recover the high you know it's like all of these things just seem so irrelevant now to the kind of images i want to capture now uh another thing i've been enjoying lately and and, and a lot of you follow me on instagram and Flickr, but you know the the self portraits i've been doing uh, they're very reflective, I think, of who I am and or who I want to project that I am uh, or want to be, right? And those are the, and and I think self-portraits are very important. I think Sean Tucker did a really good video on self-portraits about who he is and who he wants to project he is or, you know, it was like, I can't remember everything, but it was a great video. And there's many, many other great videos out there. Uh, but I don't want to get caught into the trap of, you know, creating images for that that follow sort of these classical type ideas of what makes an image good, right? <clears throat> and by that I mean, uh, you know, if you study paintings and great works of art. There's there's these one hour, two hour long videos on a single painting sometimes, right? And the symbol symbolism that's in it, <clears throat> and a little bit about the technique and the kind of the era that that painter lived in, and what he was trying to capture, and and maybe some of their other works. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that's great as a foundation to sort of think about how you might make your own creations. But what I really want to see in myself and in others, you know, we need to start creating our own unique expression in our photography. Uh, something that, you know, really hasn't been, been done or seen before. And I know how hard monumental task that can be because uh, every time I think I did something new or exciting, you know, I'll find a video. Somebody's been doing it already and they're really good at it you know um but i like the challenge i like the challenge and photography is sort of a you know a lifelong endeavor uh passion so to speak so you know enjoy the journey right don't always you know don't don't have such high expectations at the same time out of yourself just enjoy what you're doing and if you're improving and creating images that you like more and more as time goes on, then consider that a success, right? Because we'll never be 
perfect, right? Things never are perfect. Uh, anyway, that's that's kind of my message. I I don't know. Let me let me check in the chat. See who's here. I I really appreciate everyone coming in today. Um, let's see. We have John Thomas. Good to see you, Lasse. Henry. Greetings. Jeff Painter, always good to see you, and Bob and Wayne, Roberto, good to see you. Portrait stuff lately is very professional looking. Thanks, I I try, uh, <clears throat> and that that kind of gets back to. I'm trying to learn the fundamentals of portrait photography and doing portraits, so I'm practicing a lot, and then like yesterday, I just shared a video about how I created this candlelight type portrait. But it's the first time I ever did it. But I said, oh, you know, this came out okay. Let me share how I got it, you know. And I didn't watch any videos on how to do candlelight portraits, you know, before I started trying to figure it out. Because I like to try to figure things out for myself. Uh, and then I figured, you know, I kind of got a decent result. And I said, oh, let me share this. Maybe some other people might like, you know, what I did here. But uh, <clears throat> anyhow, um, good to see you, Dave. Good to see you. David Tellitz here, Wayne and Case, or Ken, Ken Wise, I'm sorry, Plato, good to see you. John Follows, John Yutze, awesome. Um, John Matthews, good to see you. So speaking of sharing, what A3 size printer would you buy? I, I just, I, I don't know, be honest. Um, I use a Canon uh, P100 that you see behind me, and that works great, but that's an old printer. I would, um, I'd probably buy another Canon <laughs> if I were to buy another uh, large format printer. Uh, sorry, I, I can't give you good, good advice on that. Um, yeah, dates are just, just numbers on a calendar. It's a continuous journey. I know it's like um oh Robin is here. Hey Robin, how are you? I just I watched your stream this morning. You're so good at streaming. I'm really uh jealous or envious after it's live. Just there's a little tick box on YouTube where you can play it back at 1.5 times speed. And then and then I might be close to what Robin can do. <laughs> uh wow, it's amazing. But yeah, that that was a great stream. A uh, lot a lot of great ideas from everyone about uh what they'd like to see in the next camera because that that rumor is out that they're coming out with a new camera uh next year or announcing one at least um yeah happy to, yeah robin i i just looked at um you know because i stopped doing streams a year ago back in november last year uh because I felt like, in the end, based on a lot of feedback, that you know that the, the streams were kind of a waste of time, right? And certainly the numbers bear that out with respect to, uh, you know, number of subscribers, how much money you make on a stream, number of views. Uh, it seemed like you know they were they were sort of, they had sort of a negative impact. But on the flip side. Uh, I feel like I'm missing that connection with the community. And I I don't know. I love to come out here and just ramble for two hours. I never have any planned topic. I just turn the camera on and, uh, you know, start talking, right? <clears throat> Whatever comes to mind. Uh, that's that's just how I roll. Even, even the videos, because when I was watching your stream yesterday, Robin, you said something to the fact that, you know, you have a buffer and you queue up three, four, five videos. Uh, planned out and you know so, some of them might be like 90 percent done already but you may not publish them until next year and then if you look at my channel like the video i pumped out i think it was yesterday i just woke up that morning had a bug up my butt to try to do a candlelight portrait and uh after a couple hours of practicing i said let me make a video <laughs> and i made a video and then by one o'clock you know i had had it all edited and everything <clears throat> so I'm sort of a spur of the moment type uh, YouTuber where, you know, I don't plan necessarily a video or what I'm going to do next week. It's just uh, with the exception of like product reviews that are sort of obligatory, right? I 
if I accept a product, I have to review it, which is fine. But uh, generally speaking, everything else is more like I just get up that day and say, oh, let's see. Oh, there's some good questions here. Let me see if I can answer these. Or yesterday it was like, wow, I, I, I like how this uh, candlelight portrait came out. Let me share how I created this, uh, you know. Uh, so I'm totally opposite. I'm still operating like I'm a brand new YouTuber, just cranking out videos, you know, whenever I can. But I, admi I admire those YouTubers that can just, like you, that can just buffer out, you know, three, four, five videos ahead of time and have these all planned out and released on on some schedule. <laughs> like I think you said every Monday and and you watch other channels and they say, oh, every Tuesday and Thursday or every Friday or, you know, new videos. And I'm like, wow, you know, how do you guys do that? You know, I just, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't take YouTube seriously enough as, as a content creator, but I'm more about just, uh, YouTube is just more of an outlet for me to, for my creative side of me and also to try to help people because at my core, I really want to help people. I want people to, to succeed. Whatever they're doing, you know, the best way I can help is with their photography, more specifically their Olympus cameras. But uh, that's where my heart is and my passion on YouTube is, is just trying to help people learn how to use their cameras. And YouTube is just a great way, great way to do that. Um, you know, if I could, I would like have people over my house every week and we just sit down for a couple hours and I show them how to do things, you know, best I can. I mean, I do meet with people every week at the photo clubs and that's one opportunity where, you know, I can help people. Uh, but when I, when I want to do my own photography, uh, I usually go out alone still. I like to go out on my own and just shoot or I can kind of just concentrate on what i want to do right when i go out to uh on the photo meets and with the photo club and stuff i always feel like i need to help this person they're just you know because it's driving me nuts why why are you shooting aperture priority for birds in flight you know it's like no 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 you know that's kind of an extreme example but uh you know there's so many people they want to get out and they want to take these great images and they have no idea how to use their camera or what settings would work best to capture these kinds of images. Uh, you know, yeah, use a macro lens or use an extension tube, use a flash here, do that. You know, these are the kind of things that when I go out and, and maybe I shouldn't do that, you know? Um, you know, cause I, I've always believed that unless somebody asks for your opinion, you know, just, just keep quiet. You know, they don't want it. They don't want your opinion if they don't ask for it. Uh, but it seems like people appreciate what I do when I go out, when I can, uh, to help help them with their photography. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, let's see. Some camping videos. Wow. I'm still a little uneasy with Ellie going camping. I, I feel like she would get us both killed. Uh, because there's bears where I camp, and uh, or you know that I can get, that I can get to by car. And there's nothing but bears all the time. She would get us killed because she would she would try to attack the bear as soon as she saw it. She has no sense of her size, right? <laughs> I mean, she's about a forty-two pounds, you know, maybe eighteen inches high. She's not a very big dog, but she, you know, she'd go after a black bear like, like that, like no hesitation. <laughs> and the bear would just step on her, then kill me, you know. And, uh, oh, thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll try and do more. You know, when I, when, when I'm doing my portrait stuff, if I do something kind of new or interesting, uh, I'll try and make a video right after. And let's see, Dion is asking, how to get better photos with the Olympus 1718 for landscape photography? Is it stacking? I never tried that. Any suggestion? Well, by better, I'm, the question is, 
what do you mean by better? Do you want sharper? In which case, yes, yeah, stacking could help. Uh, you know, are you talking about in terms of composition? You know, maybe not. <clears throat> um, you know, it's going to be all about location. I mean, there's. It's a little bit of a broad question for me to answer, but um, I assume you mean sharpness because you're asking about stacking. It's not really necessary. All you really need to do is learn the uh, hyperfocal rule, right? Is you focus about one third of the way into the frame at f5.6, and then everything from that one third out to two thirds will be tack sharp. <clears throat> um, it's not necessary in a landscape photo. Uh, for example, you're taking pictures of, say, mountains, right? And you focus one third of the way in at f5.6, and then you get home and you look at the image and you're like, ooh, you know, the mountains in the background are not tack sharp. You know, maybe I need to focus stack those. But I think really, that's not the important thing in landscape photography. Landscape photography is is all about the the kind of the mood and the feeling that you want to project, right? So personally, I, I wouldn't worry about getting things sharp front to back with landscape photography. I would focus more on the composition and the feeling and the mood that you want to project from that image or the story that you want to tell. Um, a 17 is is wide but sometimes it's not wide enough so another thing you can do and i like to do this a lot are uh panoramics so i will take you know five or six shots with a 17 i'd probably only they take three images and stitch them together and make a panoramic um that can make a big difference but when you start to get into focus stacking um that's going to take some experimentation right uh, where to start focusing from to what the end point is uh, before you hit infinity focus on your lens. Because sometimes, uh, you know, you might put in, say, do 10 steps at one, one point increments, and then it doesn't reach infinity focus, and then things are not in focus in the background, right, that are off at a distance. So uh, you have to experiment a little bit with stacking to get that right. But um, yeah, focus, focus more more on the mood and the feeling of the image when you're doing landscape photography. And, and I wouldn't worry about getting everything sharp front to back. You know, think about, uh, you know, you're projecting a, you're creating a two-dimensional image. Think about ways to create a three-dimensional image, right? How can I show that depth in the image? And a lot of times that's with the background being a little bit blurry, right? So you have a foreground, uh then maybe the subject in the middle somewhere and then in the background you have your clouds and your mountains for example uh so you have some depth right and then to create that mood or feeling you know look at the lighting you know is it golden hour is it twilight you know <clears throat> think about the the kind of feeling that you want to project is the moon out so uh that's that's how I would look at landscape photography, and it and with the seventeen you'll be able to you're perfectly fine. It's wide enough, or you can just make panoramas. Um, but yeah, I would think about trying to create depth with landscape, and really that that should hold true for just about any photograph, not just landscapes. Is is creating that depth, right? Foreground, midground, background, lighting. Um, and then subject, right? What are you taking a picture of and why are you taking a picture of it? What story do you want to tell or feeling do you want to project? Uh, these, these things, I think, far away, you know, getting everything sharp via, say, focus stacking. Um, that's what I would approach. Yeah, you could do fantasy portraits as a business. I don't know. I, I turned down a job yesterday. Um, I kind of wish I went and did it now because I could use the money. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. Business and, and money doesn't drive me in photography. I mean, I do it because you have to to survive, right? But 
um, I certainly could be doing a lot more as a business to make more money, but I'm more interested in the photography itself and and make and improving my photography, right? Uh, so don't ask me about marketing and all of that for business. I'm not the guy, uh, <clears throat> but um, I'm more about so you know creating these these this ai thing right generate these backgrounds and things i'm kind of doing that for fun and i think it does create some interesting images but i don't know if i'd want to do it as a business right because i kind of cringe a little bit sometimes when there's too much processing and too much artificial intelligence so to speak like this ai generative ai stuff it's not really my image anymore even though i'm in it like i did the candlelight portrait i think that that if i was really really a good photographer i could have done that portrait without the generative ai and still create a very powerful image right or more powerful image than you could ever do with ai um so i while i i like to use and change the background time to time uh i really want to minimize the reliance on generative ai to create backgrounds but focus more on how can i make this a more powerful image how can i get the lighting because i you know when you study like these the, the the masters of photography and i i look at a lot of them now i'm just so amazed at the lighting how how did they get the lighting and the tonality in the image like that you know 50 years ago and i get it you know they're shooting film and nothing can reproduce the look of film but film has a relatively limited dynamic range relative to our digital sensors that we can do today especially if you're going to start doing bracketing and things and uh i can never i could i struggle to be to recreate some of the portraits or the tonality in the portraits that i see by these masters uh in portrait photography it's just i'm just so i'm just floored by what what they were able to do with the limited technology that they had at the time right they did everything basically by eye right because <laughs> uh, they didn't have electronic viewfinders and they didn't have the wide dynamic range that we can accomplish today with the technology that we have and yet they were able to master the tonality in in their images and the and the range of lighting and putting that all together somehow and making this just stunning image uh <clears throat> i now i forget why i went on that that tangent but it, yeah i if you can if there's one advice i could give you or if i could give myself when i started 10 years ago is to study the masters <clears throat> really study them uh because it it's it's so different from the kind of things that you see on youtube churned out every day when it comes to say and i'm talking about portrait photography uh because i i've watched i don't know just countless countless hours of videos on portrait lighting flash led posing you know just tons of technical type videos of how to do portraits and none of the images i've ever seen from any of those videos can come close to the kind of images that i've seen by the the masters of portrait photography you know from 20 30 40 50 years ago maybe more 70 years ago it's just uh and i'm not talking about you know there's some nostalgic factor in how people are dressed maybe some some of the locations and scenes i'm talking about just a pure uh the the imagery itself and the tonalities and and how they put the the images together whether it's black and white or it's color how they put the colors together or see the colors in a scene and capture it the right way it's just amazing and i i watched a video by one youtuber and he's he's a great macro photographer uh, i think it's michael wydell 
But he said he went to an art gallery and, you know, the images uh, are photograph, not an art gallery, but a photo exhibition or what do they call those things, you know, where they, they feature a particular photography, uh, a feature a particular photographer and their work. Uh, and, you know, he, he really liked the images, but he felt like, you know, there's a, like 4 billion images produced every day online that this kind of photography is not impressive anymore uh, because everybody's able to do it. And I'm like, I don't think so. This is not, I, I mean, maybe he's not seeing it or maybe he's seen too much and it's just jaded by the, the, the volume of photography that we have that we're exposed to every day when we're into this kind of, you know, hobby. Um, <clears throat> but when I look at a lot of the images from the masters of photography, I'm just floored. I'm floored. I've, I've never been floored by anything I've really ever seen on Instagram, uh, even from huge, you know, uh, channels or whatever they call it on Instagram and Flickr. I'm never floored by it. I'm like, I'm impressed and the images are beautiful, but I've never been floored by it. I'm not, I'm like, I think this is something I could do uh, with a little effort, you know? If I just analyze how they took the photo, the technicalities, the composition, I feel like I can reproduce that, you know, with a little effort, right? Whereas, I've been working on this one portrait uh, for a couple of weeks now, not every day, but I've been working on it a little bit every day and, and I've been thinking about it every day. How did they do this? You know, how did they get the tonality in the skins like that? And uh, I'm, I'm struggling, <laughs> I'm struggling. And, I, and the name escapes me now. If I don't look at something every day, I forget. But yeah, it's it, it is really quite 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 something, and that's that's what I mean about uh, when I started the stream about you know I'm really happy with where my photography is going because now I'm starting to see what what I can do and what I can create and how I can be different. But studying the masters helps you to uh, appreciate what a different or how powerful an image can be right uh visually speaking never mind if it's a story because there, there's a lot of photography that i don't like right i don't like journalistic type photography where you see uh that is very dark you know and weird and uh and then also some like wartime type stuff that yeah, I get it. If you're a National Geographic photographer in a war zone, these images are very powerful and they they share a story that that nobody else would ever know about, right? They're very important. So I don't want to take away from how important that photography is. But I don't like to look at it, you know? It just it 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 pains me, you know? And uh it's not the kind of photography I want to get into and maybe that's kind of a selfish view of of that kind of work because like i said it is very important it can be very powerful and have a very powerful message but it it uh i'm just i just don't have the strength to look at them so to speak right it just it's too too painful um but i do like but i do like seeing very powerful images that are somehow visually striking, you know? I mean, the, the, the low hanging fruit is uh, like, um, oh my God, my memory. I should get checked for my cognitive because it's slipping. I should be able to remember these guys' names like, like this. Um, Thank God, you know, for YouTube, I can edit all the videos and double check everything before I send it. And then after I, I'll watch it later and I'm like, oh, I forgot to mention this and I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> like, 
like in the candlelight video, I forgot to mention why I used the small flash with the grid and barn doors <clears throat> versus the typical, you know, you want to diffuse the light, use an umbrella or modifier of some kind. And I used a very small light because candlelight is a very small light. So I wanted to mimic that harsh shadow, small light of a candle by using a small bare flash, <clears throat> excuse me, small flash. That was part of my thought process when I was creating that image. And I, I forgot to share that part. And I'm, I'm, I know a lot of people that are learning flash photography get that. They probably got that from just watching it without me having to say it. But it's the little details like that that a lot of beginning photographers miss, right? They don't understand why am I using a small flash, bare bulb sometimes, when everybody else is using a modifier, right, to soften the light. Well, I want to recreate that harsh lighting from a candle, so I'm using a small light. Um, anyhow, let's see, what else do we got? Stream's not a waste of time. Whoever said that, ignore them. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, and Robin Wong is a pro at answering questions fast and effectively, efficiently, and always with a positive attitude and a smile. I know. He's the happiest photographer on earth. I've always said that. You know, it's like you can't help but watch his uh videos and his live streams without coming out a little bit happier and feeling good about the world right and it says here it says your instructional videos about olympus cameras are great i tutor people and always refer to them to your videos for oh thank you ken thank you i'm always embarrassed to talk about my youtube channel like in the photo club because <clears throat> people come up to me and say oh i heard you have a youtube channel and I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't like to talk about it. I don't know why. Uh, you know, I try not I try not to promote myself outside of, you know, just on YouTube itself, right? Um, but if I do make a video that I think is specific to whatever challenge they're having, I might refer them to that. But in the photo club, there's everybody's using every different kind of camera. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, my videos are so specific to certain things, it's, it's hard sometimes to say, yeah, watch this video. Well, if you don't have an Olympus camera, it's not going to help you that much because Olympus cameras do this thing specifically in a certain way. And sure, you might be able to extrapolate from the settings that I use on Olympus camera what you would need to do, say, on a Canon or Nikon or Sony. Uh, but it's not the same for somebody that's a beginner, right? They, they you know, it's it's hard for them to extrapolate settings from one camera to another because they're not quite there yet they they'll get there eventually but um anyhow like the video i made yesterday on the candlelight portrait was was for uh one of my students quote unquote uh i don't charge her anything but i i you know i go mentor her time to time and then she buys me lunch, which is awesome. But, uh, you know, it was, so I tried to make it kind of generic, but also tie it back to the Olympus EM5 Mark III and kit lens, showing that this is relatively modest equipment, but you can create, you know, fabulous images with it because it's not about the gear, right? It's about how you use the gear. As, as always, which everyone's heard a million times over and over, and yet we still buy, you know, Sony A7R5 like I did, right? <laughs> um, but buying gear is totally separate from photography, in my opinion. Um, oh, okay, John, we'll see you later. Thanks for dropping in. And John says, your authenticity and knowledge are your greatest strengths. Uh, great YouTube attributes. I don't watch those hyper-produced channels like Peter McCannon and others. Yeah, I can't watch Peter anymore. I, I watched a few of his videos out of curiosity. It's like, how does this guy get a million views? Uh, and then the guy before him, I think his name was Casey. Another New York guy that 
he he used to vlog every single day and i was this was years ago but i was showing my cousin a video by this guy because this was when i was getting started i'm like watch this video by this guy why is there a million views on this video he's just walking down the street talking about nothing you know <laughs> like i just i just couldn't i couldn't understand it and i watched another video about why he gets a million views by another youtuber about how he tells stories and builds tension and you know has this uh, resolution and then you get into the storytelling arc and all of this stuff right and i'm like okay so he's a storyteller and that's why he gets a million views and, and that's why a lot of channels like thomas heaton he's a storyteller right um gets lots of views um and he's a, he he makes great content and I love it, but I know what he's doing uh, with respect to you know hiking these mountains twice because every video you watch of his, he's driving away or he's walking up a mountain. He had to walk back down that mountain to get his camera to go back up. You know what I mean? It's like he's doing everything twice. And I said, oh my God, you know, um, I don't know if I could do that, and and I can't because I. If I walk from point A to point B, I'm not walking back to point A. Uh, I don't know, because I'm not I'm not trying to tell a story. I'm just trying to sh show my photography or talk about something. Uh, so that's kind of the big difference, I think, between my channel and a lot of other channels is they're more story driven. And that's great for views and it's entertaining. Um, but I, I just, I can't, I, I'll have to do it one day. I'll have to make an epic video one day like that or a story-based type video. Because I have seen some really good story videos. You know, they're long form, but they tell a great story. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the guy. He talked about why he doesn't shoot with the Fuji X100V. Um, he bought it. And he liked it, but then um, all these things happened in his life, and he found that he didn't really need an X100V to do photography the way he wanted to do it. Um, it's a great, great story. I wish I could remember it better and tell you guys. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, maybe I'm just lazy. I don't know. But I, I don't see the point of hiking a mountain twice. Just so you can see me walking away from the camera or or walking to the camera from, from around the corner, you know, or driving off in my van, knowing that I'm going to have to drive back and get my camera, then drive to the next location and do it again. You know, <laughs> like, wow, you know, it's crazy. Uh, the amount of work that they put in their videos and they, they end up making great content and telling great stories, but that's not me. <laughs> I can't do it. And John says, with film, you need to get every step of the profit process perfectly with film for exposure to the final print. I know, right? It's not just taking the picture and setting everything up. It's the processing afterward, developing the film, then... then uh, developing the print, right? That was a whole analog process from A to Z. So when you think about all of that, you know, it's even more impressive, the, the technical skill from point A to point B. And the amount of, the amount of uh, creativity that can go into each step, right? Because you can you you can be all creative and create the lighting and the pose and the composition, whatever it is, and take the picture, right? Uh, if 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 you're doing portrait photography or if you're or if you're just uh, more of a capture the moment type where you're just out with your family taking pictures, right? Because um, there's one photographer they she just took pictures of her family or family type events but and yet the colors are amazing you know how do they capture that color that scene that mood that emotion you know at somebody's house because she's just at somebody's house and she takes a picture and i'm like wow look at that picture it's just shocking you know 
Uh, <clears throat> but you add you add on to that that there's there's a development process of the film, which you can make creative choices there as well. You know, pushing and pulling, using different chemicals, yada yada, to actually using an enlarger and developing the print where you can do more things, right? With temperature and chemicals and dodging and burning and and it's just amazing. It's amazing, you know, so maybe that's what I'm missing, right? Is they created this image not so much in the camera, but in the processing of the film and the print. Maybe maybe that's what I'm missing, and that's why I'm having such a hard time recreating it with a digital camera. Um, and Sean Tucker, yeah, he's he's amazing. Um, I don't watch enough of him, but um, I just love I love channels where they're very very articulate for the most part, much more so than I ever will be. And I, I imagine a lot of it's scripted. If I sat down and wrote a script, I could probably be a little bit more articulate and create a better story and <clears throat> and follow all of the, the rules of the genre of storytelling. Um, but I'm just too lazy. I'm like, that's just not what my channel is. People want to come into my channel and learn how to fix something, right? Like I got a, a comment the other day about, you know, the GPS settings are not being loaded into Lightroom. I'm like, that's interesting. And I got a comment <clears throat> last week or two weeks ago about the settings are not being loaded into their OM1 system from OI Share. So they're, they're saving their custom settings onto their phone or through OM Workspace and loading it back into their camera. And yet the settings are not coming in. And I'm like, you're right. There's something wrong here. <clears throat> um, I save like custom settings. I never noticed it before until one of one of my viewers brought it up is if you save your custom settings in shutter priority mode, the shutter speed is not saved or maybe it's being saved, but it's just not being recalled back into the camera. So I because I have my birds and flight settings, one two thousandth of a second, for example, and saved into C3 and I save that to my phone or I save it into OM workspace. When I recall those settings back into my camera, the shutter speed's not there anymore. It defaults back to one two fifty of a second. Now it looks like all the other settings were recalled, but shutter speed was not. So I posted something on the MU43 form and no one really I didn't get I didn't get any bites on that. I got one or two people got back to me, said, did you, you know, but for the most part, this issue is unresolved in my mind, so I'm gonna look into it again. I don't know what the problem is, <clears throat> but if you guys have an OM1, save your settings in shutter priority mode at one two thousandth of a second. Doesn't matter what the other settings are, they seem to be fine. And then recall them either through the app or through OM workspace and see if your shutter speed comes back or not. Um, I don't know. I can't get it to work. Uh, <clears throat> any suggestions for good work laptops to work with PhotoLab 7 Elite must have Thunderbolt 4. So Thunderbolt 4, that's going to be an Intel-based processor most likely. I think Apple and AMD may have some now. I don't know if they got that license work out, but uh, if you get an Intel processor, uh, you're definitely going to get Thunderbolt 4 you know, on their higher end, their, their i7s, i9s. But I can tell you what I got was, I got this i9 32 core processor with the RTX 4080. Um, you know, it's a $2,500 laptop. You may be able to find a better deal on it now, but I bought it when it first came out. And I want to expand it to 32 gig. I'm kind of stuck at 24 right now for different reasons, but uh you want to get 32 gig of ram but for speed and processing uh get the fastest uh graphics card you can and then the processor you probably don't need to go full on i9 32 core you can probably get away with um like an i7 
even or lower end i9 but get the fastest processor i think i've heard different different um different review or different feedback on this some people say if you just get like a basic graphic card like a 4050 or 4060 uh that'll get you 90 percent there and spending more money the the return on investment is is you know diminishes right uh core rtx 2060 and moving to this 32 core 4080 was a huge improvement huge uh <clears throat> so and i i and when i'm processing the images i noticed that you know when i'm doing deep prime xd and stuff that most of the processing is going on in the video card right because the, the the cpu might be down at like 10 or 15 percent but then I'll see like 90% on the GPU and specifically that the NVIDIA RTX 4080 is doing all of the work in the processing. So that leads me to tell you that get as much as you can on the, on the GPU. And specifically there's, there's a GPU, I think, I don't know what level it cuts off, but the 4070, the 4080, there's a, there's a, uh, there's like 192 bit versus 256 bit sort of memory pathways. Uh, I think you have to get the 4080 to get the full 256 bit, but you might be able to get away with a 4070 Ti. I think the Ti has the the 256 bit, but a better person to ask is like Marco over at Hot Hardware. They have a uh, YouTube channel. You could leave a comment on probably any of the videos that they produce. And they'll see it and that he can answer it for you. Uh, but the, he would be the person to ask. Um, if I recall, we did a, you can watch uh, one of my live streams. Let me pull it up for you. I had him on not too long ago where we talked about this specifically. I'll give you a link to that video. The reason the reason I'm giving you this link is because I can't remember everything. <laughs> uh, but in that video, in this live stream that I just put a link to, we do go through performance of different software, including Photolab, and showing the showing the performance of Photolab on different processor and video card combinations. And uh, there may be links to no, there's no links in the description, but that video would be a good one to watch to answer this question much better uh, than I can right now. So I'll refer you to that, and um, that'll give that's a much more in depth type thing. You know, it's a two hour stream, so we go into a lot of detail in there. And um, Let me go up because we were talking about film briefly. <clears throat> There's the laptop. Have you tried doing focus bracketing with your camera on a tripod with a sliding bracket? Uh, no. I bought a $10 bracket, so it's, it's a little wobbly. Um, but no, I haven't tried it. Um, I would, I would much rather use the camera's internal focus bracketing if it's available, and it and it is on our Olympus cameras, right? Focus bracketing, and it's available on a lot of modern cameras now. And um, I'd rather have a very very sturdy tripod and just use the camera's internal focus uh, bracketing feature. 
but um yeah i i've never used a quality sliding bracket i have a cheap one that i threw in the closet and never used again i used it once and uh it's just too frustrating i'm like the camera has it built in i'll just use that <laughs> um studying the masters are great but certainly makes one feel inadequate um i would look at it like there's certainly a long way to go right inadequate is just yeah that's uh i wouldn't use that phrase i would just use that i still have a lot to learn have you seen the special dorothy lang exhibit exhibit at the national i have not i don't think i'm familiar with dorothy lang at all believe it or not um there's a uh joe edelman he posts a quote let me uh but he has a set not not his normal uh instagram channel i can't find it now it's something 80 percent photography or something 80% photography. <clears throat> Let me put a link to that. Okay, if you're on Instagram, I would follow this channel on Instagram. It's from Joe Edelman, but he puts a quote from a master photographer like every day or something. And then from there, I'll look at the work of that particular photographer um and then what i'll do is i'll i'll create pins of certain images that i like so i'll pull up one example but um have you been yeah dorothy I've not seen Dorothy Lang's <clears throat> work. Dorothy. Oh, okay. I recognize her images. I'm, uh, I don't know if this is the right. this 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 person yeah this is good stuff but this is <clears throat> this is borderline the kind of photography i don't particularly care looking at uh it's just a little bit too maybe i need to explore more it's a little bit too dystopian for me you know it's a little bit too depressing sometimes um i mean it it's certainly good work but i i'm not ready for this yet so to speak i'm just i'm just not ready for dorothy lang's work <clears throat> it's too it's just too uh it just feels dark and depressing a little bit. But maybe maybe I haven't looked at enough of it because the one I always see is that one of the the, the mother holding with her kids. And that, that image just depresses me. <laughs> so I I didn't really go beyond a few of those images before I stopped looking at her stuff because it was just it didn't make me feel feel good. Um, anyhow, so it's it's probably best to say I'm just not ready for her yet. <clears throat> um, and Mark Laporte, hello, good to see you. And Thomas is here, joining late from Georgia. And... Um, Rob, you have a Sony A7? Yeah, I have one. 
I have one. Um, it's this one. It's so complicated. So many things in this camera I'll never use. Um, it's okay. It. This is another thing that I've noticed with, you know, these these other high end type cameras, right? Is uh, <clears throat> they just don't have the same kind of passion that the Olympus cameras have. You know, in, in the design, the design is very utilitarian, and. It's certainly, you know, you can get around and navigate things fine, but it's it's very utilitarian. And it does it just feels like a piece of technology. And this is how I felt about when I first bought my first Sony camera. That was my first camera when I got into photography, really. Uh, first interchangeable lens camera. It just always felt like a piece of technology and not not a photographer's tool, so to speak. Uh but fortunately, like I talked about in the beginning of the stream, I'm a little bit beyond that now. I can kind of get past the, the sort of the, the utilitarian technical things of this camera and really focus on my photography and think about how this camera can help me capture what it is I want to capture. Uh, this was mostly a gas purchase because of the high megapixels. I got such a good deal, but uh, I'm finding that this lens, the 55 millimeter Zeiss 1.8, this is a magical lens. I really, really like the images I'm getting out of this particular lens. Um, and I, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing more with this camera. It's still too early for me because I'm still fumbling a little bit when I get out with it, but uh, I, I'm really excited. I'm going to do a video about breaking in this camera once I kind of get a feel for the kind of images I can take with it. I mean, I get it. 55 millimeters is 55 millimeters, you know. Whatever that field of view is equivalent across this and the Fuji and the Olympus. But... It's different on full frame, it's different on APS-C, it's different on micro four thirds, right? Um, so I'm trying to capture images that take advantage of that difference uh, somehow. And I just don't have a feel for that camera yet and what it can do for me as a photographer. Um, I, you know, I watch all these videos of, of people talking about how great this camera is. And, you know, the, yeah, the auto, I noticed, I noticed the autofocus is not as good in low light, though, as my Olympus cameras. It doesn't seem to just snap or lock on or it just totally fails sometimes. Where my Olympus camera is just like this. And in, in the same lighting condition, right? I'm not saying it's, terrific in low light it's really good but uh <clears throat> it's certainly better at capturing focus and low light than the sony is right now just a little bit i've been messing with it but um anyhow yeah all the videos i've seen on this this camera my focus was can you really see the extra resolution Short answer is yes, you can see the extra resolution if you try, right? You will see it. Uh, in practice, do you really get more resolution? Not really. Images are going to look the same no matter which camera you take it with. You don't really see the extra resolution uh, in, the, in the usual places that you would post an image online. Or even if you're printing... And if you're printing super large, you know, your viewing distance, normal viewing distances kind of offset any kind of detail gain you might get in resolution. There's that, you know, there's that whole um, uh, discussion about what's the point of high resolution, right? And I tend to agree with it. 
but I bought this camera because, yeah, I kind of got, I got sucked into the high res kind of hype and, um, and I needed a full frame camera to do lens reviews because I'm getting offers for full frame lenses now to, to review. So I'm like, well, okay, I can offset the price of that camera with these things people send me, right? So I was able to justify it a little bit more. But um, I wouldn't recommend this camera really to anyone unless you really need 61 megapixels for something very specific. And if you know what it is, then you know you need that camera. You know, one thing might come to mind is like art reproduction, you know, where every, every brush stroke or every pixel is going to make a difference in that reproduction. Um, And just wanted to say thanks for your help. I watched several of your videos on Flash. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I try. I try to walk through everything. I forget to mention things sometimes, but I try to make it something, somebody that doesn't know anything about a particular thing, that they can watch it and try for themselves, right, and get, learn something. And Tom says, Rob, have you done... If you have a drone, you can hover and record yourself walking up and then fly up, fly it up to, yeah, I know, right? Uh, I do have a drone, but I, I never use it because uh, within, I, it, drones are banned within 50 square miles of where I live, if not further. So I'd have to drive way out, and it's banned practically at all national parks. So beyond that, I don't know where to go with it, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's a problem. It's a problem for me. So I never, I never used it. I've had it for three, three years now, and there's no place I can go with it that I can use it. I mean, out in the UK, it seems like they're using drones everywhere. Like uh, James Pops is, he takes his drone everywhere, and I see some other YouTubers using their drone everywhere. And then if you see any YouTubers in the U.S. using a drone, you don't have to look too far before you see a video about how they got a fine for using their drone. <laughs> um, so you won't see too many U.S. vloggers using a drone, I don't think. I think Tony Northrup uses his drone frequently, but he knows where to go. I guess where he lives, there's more, I don't know. I'll have to talk to him about that. And a lot of YouTubers put more energy in the production. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Some some videos are just such a waste of time. Like like movies, right? I watched uh, I watched a movie yesterday. After I made that video, I sat, you know, I went to wind down and uh, I watched the movie. It's such a waste of time. I liked it, but it was, you know, I didn't get anything productive out of it. And uh, Robert, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> These super chats and donations and buy me a coffee things. I mean, they, they helped me so much. It's... Uh, so I rely on it for my income, one thing, but, uh, you know, it also goes into the things that I buy for this channel, and it's a huge motivator as well for me to keep going. Um, so I really appreciate any any little bit that I can get helps helps and goes a long way, helps helps keep food on the table, <laughs> and. <clears throat> Constantine says, hi, Rob, is it not crazy that we spend loads to get the sharpest kit regardless of system? And then we try to emulate the 70s by degrading the sharpness. Um, well, I think. I think the argument is better put that you can take as sharp as image as you want. And then you can downgrade it right if you want to so you have options. Versus if you buy a lens that doesn't resolve all the megapixels that you want, right? 
then you don't have as many options, right? You're just going to get a soft image regardless. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's nice to have options, right? So you have the option to uh, emulate film and add grain and and put mist filters on. And then you have the option to say, okay, I want maximum resolution. You know, I'm going to make sure my glass, you know, I have the best glass, the highest resolution I can afford. and uh, take this picture. So high resolution cameras give you options, certainly. Uh, and then high res, you know, very good images or very good lenses will give you options to get that extra detail that you want if you, when you want it or put a mist filter on when you don't want it. Um, so I would look at it that way rather than people spending money to get a sharp lens and then, you know, yeah, they're wasting their money if that's all they want to do. I hope that's not the case. I hope they're buying the best glass and the best uh, resolution that they can afford because they need it for something specific or they just want it, right? Uh, if, they're, if they're doing that and then just creating images that are, you know, where they add grain and put mist filters on, yeah, that's a waste of time, time and money. Might as well buy like a used Canon 5D or something from the 90s or eight or 2000s. So it would be crazy if that's all they're doing, but I hope that's not the case. And thank you, George. Thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. It it helps a lot. And any recommendations for walk-around shooting bags <clears throat> for Micro Four Thirds? I've not found the setup I'm happy with. Um, depends on what camera you have, but I'll show you the two that I bought. One I bought very early on it's almost 10 years old and i still use it regularly and the other one is i just bought this last month because i have gas but um <clears throat> these are my three these are my three everyday bags this is the one i use the most this is a low pro event messenger 100. Um, so this will fit my EM OM1 with a 12 to 40 and a 40 to 150 kit lens. That's a terrific combination, 12 to 40 pro OM1 and 40 to 150 kit lens, or OM1, 12 to 40 pro, and a Godox flash, either the V1, TT, you know, whatever, any Godox flash can go in here, not the 200, but you know, any on camera flash. This is perfect. And then, uh, you know, a pocket in the front. I mean, let me put your question down so people can see the bag. But you know, a flip pocket in the front with stuff, expandable pockets on the side. So you can put a flashlight, extension tubes, hand warmers, batteries, whatever. And then also a little sleeve in the back where I keep other junk. Where's my, I usually have my badge in here that I'm a professional photographer. I don't know, it must be in my other bag now. This is a great bag. So this is uh, just so you can see Event Messenger 100. I don't think they make it anymore. Okay, now I'm going to come back to this in a second because I want to talk about bag choice in general. This is my second most used bag. Okay, this they I know they don't make this anymore, and it's hard to find. Uh, this fits everything. So what I like about this, it's relatively slim. I think this is only four and a half inches deep. Uh, but it's wide, right? Like a briefcase. But very similar features. Front pocket, expandable sides, and, uh, you know, dividers in here. So this will fit a lot, a lot. Okay, I took this bag yesterday. OM1, 12-40 Pro, 45.18, 25.1.4, and two Godox V1 flashes all fit in this bag no problem okay that's a lot uh i've taken my 300 f4 pro with the om1 in this bag i have to take the dividers out and i lay it in flat 
Um, and then also a rear pocket here. Uh, and th this has a zippered pocket on the side, which is good for uh, straps and things. And, and this front zippered pocket is useless, okay? Um, I don't tend to put anything in this because it makes the bag bulky for number one. Number two, when you take things out, I've lost things because they fall out and I didn't realize it, that I didn't zip this back and then things fall out. So I never use this. I might put, you know, back when COVID was a thing, I would put my face mask in here, but that, that was it. <clears throat> okay, and then Tenba, okay. This is my newest bag. I bought this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but this, this more comfortably fits the OM-1. It's a little snug in the event event 100. A little snug, a little tight, but it fits and it's very compact. This bag here, uh, same idea, right? A little bit more modern. What I like about this one is is there's there's this let's see if i can get this you see this blue bluish area right in here this folds flat but you can put the lens underneath that and fold it up so you can you can double stack lenses in here right top so i can fit two three lenses on this side fit the camera here this flap folds down halfway, so when you put the camera down in straight, the grip can can go here. Um, and then, you know, usual suspects, right? Front a front zipper pocket and uh, expandable side pockets. And then this one has a zippered rear pocket, which I like. Uh, it also has the zipper on the top that opens, so you don't have to you know, unvelcro or unsnap. I don't like this so much. I don't care about this. I never use it. But um, and then it has these fancy clamps. Okay. But you'll notice that all of these bags have a lot of things in common. Um, that I that I've already pointed out: expandable pockets, front pocket, etc. But one other thing I want to mention is the strap, right? On all three of these bags, the strap is stitched in to the bag directly. It's not one of those like hook loop, and uh, what do you call those things? The carabiner type things that hook onto the bag. So you're gonna be stuck with the strap that you get, but uh, generally speaking, the straps are excellent when they're stitched in directly like this if you buy a brand name like low pro or tenda or in that case that's a swiss army bag or something so this is stitched in right also this has a handle so you can just carry it too right so going back to my low pro handle to carry it and a stitched stitched into the bag directly and then it's rubberized in here. The Tenba has the best rubberized strap. You can hang that, that ain't falling off, trust me. And this, when it was brand new, was much more sticky. It's kind of gotten a little bit slippery over time because it's like 10 years old now. Um, so expandable pockets, front pocket, rear pocket, all of these things uh, are common in all the bags. And of course they're all you know waterproof on the bottom. This bag, this is my least favorite of the three that I just showed, but it's also the bag that I probably use the most because it can fit so much stuff in it. The only problem with this bag, it has the same properties, right? Stitched in, uh, strap, rear pocket, expandable, all that stuff, right? Handle to carry it, right? Um, the only problem with this bag is it's kind of floppy. So it, it doesn't have the rigidity of the other two bags I just showed you. So if you don't pack this thing full, 
you're you have it on your, around your shoulder. Sometimes it feels like it's doing this, right? Because and then everything kind of gets s swashed around inside. This is the only thing I don't like about it is that it's a little bit floppy. Uh, but most of the time when I bring this bag, it's I got it packed full because it fits a lot of stuff. And this is not a problem. It's not going to do this because everything's in here kind of keeping it rigid. Whereas the, these bags, these bags have a good rigidity. See, I can't even, I, I have to give it, you know, I have to give it some effort to squash this down, right? I mean, I could if I really, but generally speaking, these, these bags have very good rigidity. And it just makes it easier to take things in and out of the bag. Because when the bag is kind of flopping and doesn't have that rigidity, you know, it's awkward to pull things out because what happens is like, you know, one lens will kind of get squashed and go over the top of the other lens like this. So you're trying to pull this lens out and then the other lens moves. I mean, you can imagine what I'm talking about, right? It, it makes it awkward to pull things out when it doesn't have that rigidity. So. For me, when I buy a bag, those are the things I look for. Stretchy pocket, front pocket down here. Well, and this, this bag has an additional feature of covering the Velcro so that, you know, it's silent. I guess this bag here, if you leave the top zipper open, you don't have to open it via the Velcro so you can still operate silently. But this one has the the Velcro flap so that it basically turns the Velcro off. The other thing you need to watch out for is when you close the lid, you have this folding thing in on the top, and then you close it. So that way it stays weather sealed, like, you know, from splashes and things. Uh, and this this also keeps things from falling out through the top. So if you're if you're really on the move, you know, this keeps things inside nice and snug. Um, so you can see this has it also, right? This folds in and closes and keeps everything nice and snug inside. So those are the things I would look for in a bag. They're the things that I look for when I get a shoulder bag for my cameras because uh, I found over time, I use all of those things, the front pocket, the rear pocket, I'll keep like, I don't know, you, you get the idea. The side pockets are great for packing extra batteries last minute because you could be walking out the door and, you know, it's a, it's a pain to unclip and unbuckle and unvelcro to open the bag up to put stuff in. So you can just slide it in the side pocket uh, and it's not going to fall out because it's stretchy, stretchy material. Okay, anyway. Those, those, that's that's my advice on bags. Uh, this is the Tenba. I think this is the DNA nine, and it's a relatively slim profile. So these are all slim profile. That's the other thing. If you get a Tenba messenger bag, make sure you get the slim version, um, because the the non-slim ones are just bulky. Okay. You can tell I love bags. <laughs> I, I could talk about bags for days. Um, and Darko says, good morning. Good morning, Darko. Loved your Instagram black and white. Thank you. I like black and white. And John Truman, Dorothy Lang, great 1930s photographer, working people's struggles. Yeah, people's struggles, right? I got enough of my own problems. But a better way to put it is I'm not ready for her photography yet. I'm just not ready yet. I will be eventually. And good morning, Corey. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you. Speaking of camera lenses, I'm shooting family Christmas photo today. I'm using the EM1X with a 12 to 48 and 280 200s. Hoping it'll go great today. Wish me luck. Well, good luck. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. 12 to 40 is a great like lens for event photography or doing things like this, family photos. It's it's amazing. 
and the 8200s are awesome flashes. Um, I have two myself. I have two V1s and two TT350s, although one of them is kind of flaky. It's, you know, it's five years old, so it's, it's kind of on the fritz. What do you use the Sony A7R5 for that you can't do with the OM-1? Nothing right now. <laughs> I just got it a couple of weeks ago. Um, and in fact, I can do a lot more with the OM-1 than I can with the A7R5. But specifically, what does the A7R5 do that the OM-1 cannot? That is 61 megapixels, basically. You can resolve more detail with a native 61 megapixel sensor than you can with the uh, OM-1 high-res shot mode. But you have to pixel peep 100, 500% to see the difference. So in practical terms, the A7R5 does nothing that my OM-1 cannot. Uh, in technical terms, yeah, 61 megapixels is definitely out resolving 20 megapixels, clearly. Um, Shallower depth of field, obviously, because of the full frame format. So th those are two areas that I think the OM-1 will never be able to do, right? Shallow depth of field for a certain field of view and that 61 megapixel native resolution, clearly. Uh, but just about everything else the OM-1 can do and do better, in my opinion. Um, but that's my opinion. Yeah, so Robin's saying much the same thing here. Dorothy Lane documented the Dust Bowl with, and Great Depression, how it affected poor farmers and migrant workers. Yeah, kind of dark stuff. Yeah. I'm not ready. <laughs> and do you feel in getting some inspiration for your craft when... Okay, let me read that again. Do you feel in getting some inspiration for your craft when feeling blah about photography needs you just getting out no matter what? Basically, get out and shoot as I have hit a wall. Oh, okay. So you just need a little inspiration to get out. I don't think just going out and shooting is going to do it. Um, <clears throat> because when I hit a wall last year, I was still going out every week almost with the photo club and then doing stuff in between with the channel. And it didn't make it really any difference for me just to get out and shoot, hoping that something will inspire me when I get out there. Um, what, what changed for me was somehow I was looking at other photographers' work like, Sal Leader, now I remember the name. It was right around the time I started looking at Sal Leader and Egg Eggleston. And there's and I'm not really a street guy, but I was looking at their photography and I was seeing the colors that Sal Leader could produce, how Eggles Eggleston, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, was able to take relatively mundane images and just making them somehow tell a story. Like, they're not so mundane after all. There's a story behind this this particular object or street or person. Um, and somehow I was able to translate that. And I said, so my motivation and inspiration came from that. And I said, you know what? Let me see if I can take pictures like Sal Leader. Let me see if I can get pictures like Eggleston. And when I started to try to duplicate what they were doing, that's when it kind of turned for me and I started to get some inspiration and motivation from doing that. And then suddenly I said, wait, you know, I can get images kind of like that. You know? Um, so, that's what kind of changed for me, not, not the act of doing the photography and going out every week or every day, whatever it is. It was finding, finding a purpose 
to to my photography in that my goal today is to create this image because now if you're looking at images and not finding inspiration meaning you don't you look at an image and you say well what's so great about that image you know anybody can do that or if you look at the other image and you're same thing it's like eh you know that's a bigger problem right if you're not finding joy or uh you know satisfaction by looking at great images that's a different problem in my opinion but if you're looking at other work of these master photographers then maybe it's not a mass maybe it's just another guy in a photo club you really like their images uh but i that's that's what kind of turned it turned it around for me was was finding some great work and and feeling like i can do that i can do the same thing you know i can find i can start creating great images like these guys did uh you know i don't want to imitate what they're doing but trying to initially copying what they're doing and trying to duplicate or replicate what they're doing helps you to find your own uniqueness and creative sort of uh you know spirit right uh so i'm studying and studying is a loose i'll use that term loosely i'm really analyzing the works of a lot of the master photographers thanks a lot to joe edelman for creating this you know 80 percent photography channel also he has a uh uh he has a community also as well that i'm a member of and uh you know his live streams and stuff that's a different thing his live streams are very different than who i see joe edelman as you know he's a great educator obviously with all of his stuff but anyway <clears throat> uh the that that's what changed for me was is i i got inspiration by looking at other work and trying to duplicate it and then when i was able to kind of at least get close and start to see how they saw the world then i could start to s infuse my own perception of how i see the world and that's what got me through my rut and that's that's why i felt like 2023 has been such a great year for me as a photographer because now when i go out i don't i don't take like a million pictures anymore you know i can go out and come back with 30 40 50 images and be really happy with the ones i took and I don't feel like um, the other thing is don't go out and get greedy with your photography. Like go out <clears throat> with one lens, whatever that might be, not a zoom lens, take a prime. And I, and I, I, I know there's videos out there that say go out with a prime and learn how to shoot with that. But for me, going out with a single focal length, um, force me to uh look at a scene very differently and how do i want to compose or what do i want to include or exclude you know it change you know what kind of story can i tell with this focal length what what kind of emotion or feeling can i share looking at the world through this one focal length and uh you know and that's that's why my I transitioned slightly from really loving the 17 millimeter, i.e. 35 equivalent, to really liking the 25, i.e. 50 millimeter equivalent. Is because I used to go out with, you know, a single focal length, and I found that I could share what it is I wanted to share better at 50 millimeters than I could with. 35 because the 35 for me just brought too much information in and i i like to share minimal information that i can but still tell the most right less is more kind of thing and that's why i transitioned to the 50 but you might feel like the 35 is better so yeah when i get into when i was in a rut i haven't been in a rut since okay when i go out i thoroughly enjoy my photography now 
because every time I go out, I don't get greedy. So I don't take a bunch of different lenses. Because if I bring this 35 to set the 50, I bring the 40 to 150, my 12 to 4. If I bring all my lenses, because I don't know what I'm going to run into, uh, then I don't get anything good. Maybe I'll get lucky and get one. But I'm always like worrying, should I switch to this lens to capture this? Should I use this lens to capture? <clears throat> you know, you kind of get greedy and you want to try and capture everything on a single photo walk. Uh, so when you go out, take one focal length to avoid that trap of being greedy on your photo walks and focus on what story and what can you tell with that particular focal length? What can you share with the world at that focal length? Um, and find, find photographers that you like their photography or images from various photographers that you like and try and duplicate that and say, let me see if I can do that exact same thing. And then when you go out again, you might see another scene where this particular scene is very different than the one that you duplicated. And yet you feel like you feel something there that you can reproduce and share uh, in the same style as the other photo. And then by seeing, by being able to recognize that style or that feeling, you'll start to see the differences in your own creative work and what you're capable of sharing with the world, right? I'll give you a good example is I used to look at uh, one, you know, one of my viewers, they send me emails <laughs> pretty regularly, right? Not every week, but every month I'll get one or two, right? Emails at a minimum, sometimes three or four. But a lot of them are just links to hit their gallery, right? And for the first few years, I would look at them and I was like, okay, this is okay, you know? But now when I look at his images, I see a style, right? That he's, he's projecting and, and what kind of view of the world that he is projecting and how he sees the world and what he wants to project about what he sees, right? So there's a lot of things there. And, uh, and I really appreciate the kind of work that he is putting out there and sharing. And it's, it's, I, I really appreciate their photography now. Versus when I first started looking at it, I was like, it's okay. They're just street photos. It's a pretty girl. That's a nice dog. You know, I didn't really see it for what it was. I didn't appreciate his style. <clears throat> but now that I, that I have a feeling for style and form and, and emotion and storytelling and all of these things. I'm, and I'm still just taking baby steps. I'm not anywhere near, you know, where I need to be, but I'm starting to see it and start to feel it. And, and now when I look at other people's work, um, and I, and this person specifically, I see it, I get it. You know, I know exactly the kind of images that he creates and what I can expect and what I, what I, and I, I enjoy his photography much more now. So when I see, when he sends me the emails with the links now, it's not like, oh God, what is he sending me this week? It's more like, oh, let me see what he's doing now, right? Let's see what he's doing these days. You know, what's he up to? What's he want to share this week? And I'm excited to see those links and his photography uh, versus say the greedy photographer that goes out and take pictures of everything and put everything online. You know, they're cherry picking a little bit, right? But their photography is kind of all over the place. And um, there's no style, no, no reason for it. They're just snapshots. Uh, so that's, that's the best advice I can give you is, is, you know, try and find your own style, but you find your own style, I think, by being able to recognize other people's style and seeing it and being able to recreate it. Then you can start to differentiate your own style, I think. And that's what inspired me. <laughs> anyway, I just rambled on a long time about that. Sorry. Ho hopefully that was helpful. 
Your Sony camera is perfect for woodland photography, especially, yes, that's a very good, good uh, application for super high resolution. It's one of the things I thought about uh, was like landscape, but I was like, everything is so far away, you're not going to see any detail. But woodland makes sense, right? Because you got to get up close and personal with woodland photography. I mean, everything's usually within 10 meters. Uh, <clears throat> that makes sense. Thank you. Serge, Serge is an awesome woodland photography, and he's definitely developed his own style and how he sees the woodland. He does a lot of woodland photography. And now when I look at his work, it's improved tremendously over the years. That's a given. I mean, when you first sent me some images, I mean, this was like early on, like when I first started my channel, um, I was like, you know, I, I did the best I can. I was new too, right? I did the best I can to help you with whatever it was you were emailing me about. But now when I look at your photography, it's, it's light years ahead of where you were. And, um, I do enjoy looking at your photo work. And I look at a lot of people's photos in the Flickr page. I have a Flickr page with a community page and people are always posting photos there. And it's really, like I said, I'm starting to see, I'm starting to see everybody's vision and how they perceive the world and what they want to communicate in their photography um, more now than I did before. And can you compare? Yes, I did compare it, actually. It's on my Flickr page. Uh, I'll share a link. I mean, I didn't do it in depth, but... Uh, one of my albums, let me see if this album... Yeah, this is a good page. So... On this page, let me copy this link. Um, so on this page, I'm, I, I have a few images here where I'm doing comparisons, right? So here's the OM1. So th this is native resolution stuff, right? Uh, this is native resolution. I thought I had a high res shot comparison in here. This is a 20, a 40, 60. Oh, here it is. This one. So here's an 80 megapixel OM1 with, with my, the best lens ever made. The 25 millimeter f1.4 but yeah you can pixel peep these this is the fuji high-res shot mode because i have an xh2 also that's the area that i cropped in and then here's the sony uh 240 megapixel high-res shot um and this image is 5000 by 5000 so that's about one to one across the board here so you can download the image and pixel peep it even more because I think on Flickr, you don't really see a full one-to-one -one zoom here. But there's that. So there's that. And then I'm trying to create these albums that are a little bit more indicative of what I'm doing, right? So here's OM1 comparisons, but then I have like photos that are only taken with the EM5 Mark III regardless of lens. And then I have another one, like these are photos only taken with this lens, regardless of camera, so to speak. I just started doing this, so the, the, the albums are a little bit thin. They may not have a lot of photos, but... Um, here's, here's all the photos I've taken that I want to share with the... A7R5. A lot of these are with the wide angle lens because I had to do a review on it. But yeah, check that out. Uh,
I just realized I didn't have the chat chat window up the whole time. I didn't set that up. I always forget something. <laughs> um, sorry about that. And let's see. And Live J says, your videos detailing EM5 setup have really helped me with the pen EP5. Oh, thank you. I'm always happy to help. Um, I try. You know, I try to make in-detail videos. I know they're long form and they can bore you to tears if, if you're looking for one thing. But um, if, if the way I teach connects, it's great. When it doesn't connect, you know... Um, People hate me. They hate they hate those long form videos. <clears throat> Wayne Coxbag, Think Tank Retrospective 5 version 2. I'm curious. Let me look that up. Think Tank 5. Let me see what that is. Oh, this is like a canvas bag. Right? So this is five. Okay, yeah, this looks like a this looks like a nice bag. I'd have to see it in person though. But um So it has, it looks like it has stitched things on the side. It has a pocket on the back. It has the Velcro pads, so you can turn the Velcro on and off. And it has a front pocket. And then the side pockets, I can't tell. They look expandable, but they're not the stretchy expandable because there's a buckle here. But maybe they are. I can't tell. I'd have to see it in person because the only thing that concerns me about this bag I'm trying to find a good picture of Doesn't look like the like well oh it is it is kind of a stretchy expandable okay at least on this side because this side doesn't have a buckle but I can see it looks like it it expands out but what's missing from this bag as far as I can tell that's the front. That's the back. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, because every picture they're kind of hiding this fact. But it's, it doesn't have a handle on top where you can carry it, right? So those those are the two things that kind of worry me a little bit when looking at this bag is um, it doesn't have a handle, you know, like like this, like a handle to carry it. And then it doesn't look like it's very rigid. It looks kind of floppy, a little bit like this one, right? So, but it's kind of a small bag, so it may not even be an issue. Because if you take one thing out, you only got one thing left in the bag, right? So I don't, I don't know. Those, those are the two things. I have to see one in person. But I, I like the canvas style, and it looks a little bit kind of thick too. Like it's not a slim style. And then Basil says, I'd say less than 1% of shooters actually push resolution of their gear, yet that's a huge chunk of what people complain about. I know, right? 
I mean, you have to buy the very best lenses to, to approach what the sensor can resolve. And that includes a 20 megapixel sensor, not just the 60 ones, right? And that's, that's why I've always been impressed with the Olympus lenses is it seems like um, I've just really never been disappointed with a lens from Olympus because it, it the, the amount of design or the, the amount of resolution a lens can resolve on a very high density pixel pitch, like on a micro four thirds, it has to be a really good lens to be able to resolve that. I mean, theoretically, twice as good as anything else. So I've always been impressed. So that even though in practice, a kit lens is not going to resolve, you know, more than half the pixels on a out of 20. Just knowing that it resolved half of them is really amazing. And that half is still more than enough most of the time. Because a lot of the images I take, I take with kit lenses. And thank you, thank you, Live J5. I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you so much. And have you tried the Billingham Handley Pro or the small bag? They are very well made. Have all the features of being able to stack lenses. Here's a, I have not tried it. I think Jimmy Chang is, uses a, the Billingham, but they look kind of big to me, kind of fat, right? I kind of like the slimmer, slimmer designs. Even though this Temba looks big on camera, it's actually quite slim uh, overall, considering what I can pack into it. So the Billinghams, if I recall, they're, they're kind of fat. I have a couple of bags like that that I did like at the time because it did make things easy to put in and out and stuff. But I decided to kind of go slim. But I haven't tried them, so, and the style is a little bit not my style, so to speak. You know, like this, this Temba has, to me, like a modern look to it, a nice modern style. This Low Pro is very simple, right? Just one line across, and it's square. I like, I like the simple design, and uh, I like, I like this design too. Um, it works for me, but the Billingham's, I don't know. I don't, I don't like the belts and the buckles and everything on them. It's more of a style thing than I think function, right? So I like to have both right form and function. Uh, I, I suppose functionally the Billingham may be better than what I have, but the form is not really my style. So much baggage, right? Yeah. Hadley Pro, interesting. Not familiar with that one either. I, I'm I'm kind of limited to the bags that my camera store has because I like to have them physically in my hand um, and try them. And Marco's in. Awesome, Marco. Somebody had a computer question here earlier. So I directed him to our live stream that we had uh, a couple months back. Um, but I'm glad you can make it, even though we're a little bit late, because I, I'm, my voice is starting to go. And it says, that advice makes so much sense, as I have a Z5 with a 50, plastic fantastic. Awesome. I didn't know they made a 50 plastic, when I think plastic fantastic, I think cheap. They have a really awesome 51.8 Z lens. If you have that lens, I know that's a rocking lens. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, go to the bookstore, look at some photos. You can just look online. You know, there's a bunch online too. Uh, but some, some, you know, if seeing them in print is better, all, all the more reason to go to the bookstore, right? Um, for my photo walks, I use the... Rico GR3X has simplified my photography life. It's 40 millimeter equivalent. Has APS-C 24 megapixels. It has very sharp 2.8 lens. Yeah. 
I mean, that's certainly right. That's I think that's why that that's so popular because people start to use it, and they're forced to use one focal length forever, right? Um, and then whoever buys that camera starts to appreciate. I mean, I would think most people buying that camera are already kind of, you know, hardcore enthusiast photographers, because it's like eight or nine hundred dollars, maybe more for a camera like that, which on the surface doesn't offer very much other than its extreme compact size, right? Uh, and they don't get, um, and it's, it's, it's function over form in that, in that case, functionally, it's very good because of a small compact size, but it's not an attractive camera. It's just a little black box, right? <clears throat> I might have to get one one day. Just can't imagine why I would, though. But I might. I don't know. I have other cameras I want to get first. Uh, let's see. I've been trying to get to get to grips with strobe and flash, so I have watched tons of YouTube videos. Your recent video episode 488 I found very useful and good to understand. Okay, good. I'm glad that was helpful. I'll try and do some more. What was number 488? Let me take a quick look. 488. Oh, dramatic portraits with off camera flash. Yeah. So the one I just did yesterday for the candlelight is pretty similar uh, format. I just kind of walk you through how I do, do things on there. Um, I'll do some more. I'll do some more when I, when I get the inspiration to make a video. I'm usually only good for a couple hours a day. Uh, to do anything productive, and then from there, I'm not any use at all. Henry says, so it does have a handle on top. I just couldn't see it in the pictures. What it looked like in the picture was the camera strap itself laying on top. But if that's the handle, that's good. And Van, yeah, someone's mentioned Vanguard before. I've heard these are really good. Yeah. Temba is the lowest price in 30 days. Oh, maybe I need to get another one. I just love Temba. I have a Temba backpack I never use, but it's the best backpack ever. And, uh, do I have it? I have this other bag that I just use it as storage for my Astro stuff. I thought I would like it, but then in practice, I didn't like using it. And uh, hey, Rob, I read somewhere that Gen Z kids are wanting to buy older digital cameras from the early 2000s because they like the retro grainy look that. It's different. Yeah, I know it's crazy, right? I saw some video where there was like a crowd of kids around this table buying all these little old cameras. Uh, apparently, it's, it's a big deal. And thank you so much, Darko. I appreciate it. That is greatly appreciated. All the uh, coffees and, and um, super chats and donations, they are so greatly appreciated. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, I doubt they're still here because you know how my streams are. I've been going two hours now, so I probably should end here. Um, I forget. It was a very broad question, like what's a good computer for DxO Photo Lab 7, right? So I told them, uh, get a good graphics card, get an Intel because they wanted Thunderbolt 4 and 32 gig of RAM, long story short. but watching the video that we made the live stream we made a couple of months ago we'll go into more detail about all of that because we did the you did the testing and everything for it as well right with photolab and found certain combinations of processor and video graphics work better than others and i just couldn't remember off the top of my head you know what was best because when i bought my laptop you know i went all in 
I got i9 and GTX or RTX 4080. Um, but okay, I will wrap it up here. I appreciate everyone coming in today. And thank you so much uh, for the super chats and the coffee and the donations. They are so greatly appreciated. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again probably next week. Uh, and I'll do maybe another photo editing stream. Uh, but until then, you guys have a great uh, Christmas and Happy New Year if I don't see you again. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you again soon.